Family, I greet you all in the wonderful living name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. As Pastor Kenny mentioned, my name is Jono, and I have the privilege of serving as one of the pastors here alongside Pastor Kenny, who hosted us so well this morning, brother, and alongside Pastor Stephen, who, along with the band, led us so beautifully in worship, uh, and of course, alongside our lead pastor, Pastor Ono Mokatle, who is uh, currently away uh, with his family after, after a long quarter. Uh, they didn't go away in December, so they're currently spending some well-deserved time away. But uh, he did send me a text this morning saying that we are in his thoughts and in his prayers. As the global church, we celebrated Holy Week and Easter last week Sunday. And what a joy that was, right? To be reminded of the fact that we serve a living God, amen? We serve a God who knows our struggles, who is not distant, but one who sent his very son into the world to live the perfect life we should have lived and to experience the death that we should have died. We serve a God who conquered sin and death as he rose three days later in victory one who ascended into heaven and who is now seated at the right hand of the all-powerful, all-knowing, ever-present and loving God the Father, who then in his goodness, mercy and grace, even sent us Christians, his followers, his Holy Spirit, to empower us to live the life the gospel calls for us to follow. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. We praise you, Lord. In you we have victory and we have trust. And we got to celebrate that last week and what a joy it was, amen? However, family, I think think if we're being honest, I'm not so sure that our lives outside of this time and this place or outside of our family group times and places, I'm not so sure that they always reflect the victory and the hope that we have in Jesus Christ. I know that if I'm being honest, I'm not so sure that if you had to track a record of my life outside of these two or three hours on a Sunday, that you'd see me living always in the trust and the hope and the victory that we as Christians have in our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And I think it's fair to say that many of us have experienced this to be very much the case, especially these past three years in light of the COVID-19 pandemic. Permit me to take you back to a time just over three years ago, to March, tw- March the 23rd, 2020. South Africa will impose a nationwide lockdown for 21 days from midnight on Thursday to try to contain the coronavirus outbreak. President Cyril Ramaphosa said on Monday, as the number of confirmed cases jumped by 128 to 402. Ramaphosa said in an address to the nation that South Africa needed to escalate its response dramatically to curb the spread of infection. From midnight on Thursday the 26th of March until midnight on Thursday the 16th of April, all South Africans will have to stay at home, Ramaphosa said. People will still be able to go out to seek medical care, buy food, or collect a social grant, And while this measure will have a considerable impact on people's livelihoods, on the life of our society and on our economy, the human cost of delaying this action would be far, far greater. Ramaphosa said health workers, emergency personnel, and security services would be among those exempt from the lockdown. All shops and businesses will be closed, except for pharmacies, laboratories, banks, the Johannesburg Stock Exchange, supermarkets, petrol stations, and healthcare providers. Soldiers will be deployed to support the police and international travelers who traveled in South Africa after March the 9th from high-risk countries will be confined to their hotels until they have completed a 14-day period of quarantine. Furnaces and underground miners will be required to make arrangements for care and maintenance, which means operations stop but are kept in a condition to resume in future. I even forgot about the glasses fogging up. (laughs) Family, as we look back in time, what did you feel? 
Perhaps you felt tremendous sadness as this reminded you of the loss of loved ones. Perhaps the waves of grief washed over you once again as you remembered the tragic and difficult passing of someone so dear to you. And along with their passing, there was the added, added difficulty of not being able to mourn them in our usual ways. Perhaps you felt scared as you felt afresh the knock-on effect of a health condition affected by the coronavirus, a condition that even as we gather here this morning makes it difficult and challenging for you. Perhaps it caused you to feel overwhelmed as you remembered the loss of livelihoods. You had such big plans and dreams and ideas and goals for 2020, 2021, and 2022. And it seems as though you are left with just the pieces as you hustle to make a living. Perhaps you felt the fresh pain of a relationship strained or even lost. Perhaps the pandemic and the lockdown were the very conditions that led to the end of those relationships and what felt like your entire secure world. Or perhaps relationships shifted as a result of lost opportunities to connect and spend time together. Perhaps you felt angry as you reflected on the injustices brought up by the pandemic that remain ever present and ever real. Perhaps it's anxiety as the legacy of fear and, what, and the what ifs still grips us. Or perhaps you're recalling the division and the friction and the opposing opinions, the social media wars. I think family, if we are being truly honest, many of us are still very much living in the aftermath of the COVID-19 pandemic and we're not okay. We're not okay. On Sunday and at family group and each morning after spending time in the word, we feel encouraged and assured in some sense, we feel encouraged, and yet in another sense, we are still reeling from the trauma of the past three years. And because very often we haven't given these wounds to Jesus to heal, we are walking around wounded, scared, fearful, anxious, and hurt. Family, we may have stopped wearing the physical masks but for many of us, our spiritual, emotional, and psychological masks are tighter and more secure than they possibly have ever been. And so for the next few weeks, we're gonna be taking time out from our Hebrew series, and we are in, in some senses going to be debriefing these past three years as we take off our masks and as we begin a new series, focusing on post-pandemic me. Post-pandemic me. How are you doing in light of the pandemic? How are we doing in light of the pandemic? How are we doing with our relationship with others in light of the pandemic? How are we doing with God in light of the pandemic? Over the next few weeks, we're gonna talk about trusting God and we're gonna talk about fear. The Bible has a lot to say about this. We're gonna be talking about wealth, possessions, and generosity, and we're gonna be talking about what fear causes us to do and to try and hold on to. We're gonna be talking about what our lives reveal to us about where we are truly, truly putting our faith and trust. And as we come to our, our post-pandemic series, post-pandemic me series, it's our prayer that we would experience healing and restoration. Physical, spiritual, emotional, psychological healing and restoration. Many of us have lost too much to mention. We have experienced so much legitimate pain and loss. Loved ones who have passed on, jobs, work, finances, relationships that have been strained or lost. And it's our prayer, family, that during this time we would feel God's healing touch over our lives. That we would know that he sees us, that he is for us, and that our faith in his restoration for our lives would be restored, amen? We are praying that this time would serve as a healing conclusion to, in many senses, the painful chapter of the past three years, and that faith and hope and trust would rise up in us as we look to what God is calling us to next. As individual believers, but also as the body of Christ here at Rooted Fellowship. 
And so with saying all of that, we come to our text for today. Our text for today is Luke 12, verses 1 to 12. I'm going to be reading from the Christian Standard Bible, and so you can meet me there if, that's, if you've brought along a Bible. Alternatively, we'll have it up on the screen. That's Luke 12, verses 1 to 12, and I'm going to be reading from the CSB. Luke 12, 1 to 12. Verse, verse 1. Meanwhile, a crowd of many thousands came together, so that they were trampling on one another. He began to say to his disciples first, be on guard against the leaven of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy. There is nothing covered that won't be uncovered, nothing hidden that won't be made known. Therefore, whatever you have said in the dark will be heard in the light. And what you have whispered in an ear in private rooms will be proclaimed on the housetops. I say to you, my friends, don't fear those who kill the body and after that can do nothing more. But I will show you the one to fear. Fear him who has authority to throw people into hell after death. Yes, I say to you, this is the one to fear. Aren't five sparrows sold for two pennies? Yet not one of them is forgotten in God's sight. Indeed, the hairs of your head are all counted Don't be afraid, you are worth more than many sparrows. And I say to you, anyone who acknowledges me before others, the Son of Man will also acknowledge him before the angels of God. But whoever denies me before others will be denied before the angels of God. Anyone who speaks a word against the Son of Man will be forgiven, but the one who blasphemes against the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven. Whenever they bring you before the synagogues and rulers and authorities, Don't worry about how you should defend yourselves or what you should say, for the Holy Spirit will teach you at that very hour what must be said. Family, this is the word of the Lord, and so thanks be to our God. Let's pray. O good, gracious, eternal, omnipresent, omnipotent, loving, heavenly Father God, we come before you this morning as your people hurting, fearful, reeling from, from very difficult things that have happened these past three years, Lord God. And as we, as we come and as we meet you, as we open up and as we dive into your word, Lord God, I pray, Holy Spirit, that you would come, that you would use this time to reveal so much of yourself. Lord God, that you would minister to us through this time, that many would come to know you and many would come to know you in a deeper, more profound way, Lord God. We pray that you would come and heal us, Lord God, restore us. We pray this all in Jesus' mighty and holy name. Amen and amen. Now, family, some of y'all may recall from our Eating with Jesus series, where we spend some significant time in the Gospel of Luke, that Luke writes, when he writes his Gospel, he writes in a way that highlights to his audience that Jesus is the fulfillment of God's promises in the Old Testament Scriptures. The Gospel of Luke is also one of the earliest written accounts of Jesus' life. And it's the first volume of two volumes written by Luke found in the Bible in what we call the New Testament. So the books written after the life, death, and resurrection of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Luke wrote the Gospel of Luke, which is volume one of, of his writings, and then he wrote the book of Acts, which is volume two. They come together. I've mentioned this before, but it is thought that Luke becomes a follower of Jesus because of spending time with the Apostle Paul, the same Apostle Paul who wrote nearly half of the New Testament and planted many of the first churches. Luke comes to faith in Jesus after experiencing this transforming grace of the gospel. And then he trades in his day job to be the traveling companion and co-worker of the Apostle Paul. But before joining Paul on his evangelistic missions and before he began to write the Gospel of Luke and the book of Acts, Luke was a doctor or a physician. And so I think it's fair to say that Luke was very methodical. He was very detail-oriented, very logical, and he orders his Gospel in a very intentional and precise, logical way. Okay? So after coming to faith in Jesus and after experiencing the transformative grace of the Gospel, Luke writes the Gospel of Luke because he knew firsthand 
that the story of Jesus was not just ancient history of some kind of special earthly teacher, but it was in actual fact the fulfillment of the long-awaited promise between God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, yeah. the nation of Israel, and then eventually the whole world. And so, as always, family, I'd encourage you to go and be good Bereans and read the Gospel of Luke for yourselves. And if you do, you'll notice that in chapters one and two, there's this long, detailed introduction that sets up the story of Jesus and his cousin, John the Baptist. And then in chapters three through nine, Luke details Jesus' mission as Jesus moved through his hometown of Galilee. And in the first nine or so chapters of Luke's Gospel, Luke shows how Jesus brings the good news of God's kingdom to the poor in Israel the Ani, those people of low social status who are considered outsiders. And throughout the book of Luke, Luke notes that Jesus taught that his kingdom is upside down, a reversal of the world's common social values. Jesus taught that his kingdom is upside down. It's a reversal of the world's common social values. The next section of Luke where we find our text for this series in Luke 12, forms part of the center section of the book of Luke. And in chapters nine to 19, Jesus literally leads his followers on a physical journey from Galilee towards Jerusalem. And in this section, it contains many of Jesus' teachings and parables given on the road to Jerusalem, to the various people that Jesus encounters, made up mostly, of course, of his growing group of followers. And by writing it in this way, by doing this, Luke depicts following Jesus much like a physical journey. Following Jesus is something one does, and you learn as you go along life's paths. Luke shows us that being a follower of Jesus or a disciple means very much participating in Jesus' mission and making it part of your everyday life. Oh Lord, would your mission as revealed to us in this text in Luke 12 for today become very much part of our daily lives. It's also worth noting that in this middle section, as laid out in chapters nine to 19 of Luke, Jesus teaches more about trusting in God's provision and on possessions and on generosity than anywhere else in his teachings. Chapters nine through 19 of Luke, Jesus teaches more about trusting in God's provision and on possessions and generosity than anywhere else in his teachings. Trusting God. Trusting God. You'll also recall from our Eating with, Je uh, Eating with Jesus series that the Gospel of Luke is full of accounts where Jesus tables with social outsiders and the poor. He also tables with the religious leaders of the time, known as the Pharisees. And these two groups of people and their response to Jesus is often contrasted in the Gospel of Luke. And in Luke 11, Jesus has just been tabling with these hard-hearted religious Pharisees and once again confronting them on their pride and their hypocrisy. And so that's where our text, Luke 12, fits into the broader book of Luke this morning. And that's where we find our post-pandemic selves today as we take a deeper dive into our text this morning. Luke 12, verse one, it says, meanwhile, meanwhile, so in other words, just after Jesus has dined with these Pharisees and after he's confronted them on their pride and their hypocrisy, he heads out onto the road towards Jerusalem. And then verse 12 carrying on, it says, a crowd of many thousands came together so that they were trampling on one another. So clearly Jesus' reputation is rapidly growing, fam, okay? Especially amongst the poor. Carrying on, verse one. He began to say to his disciples first. He began to say to his disciples first. And so he zones in on those closest within the crowd and he says something really important for them to understand. And he begins to warn them. And he says this. Be on guard against the leaven of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy. Be on guard against the leaven of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy. Now, why does Jesus use the metaphor of leaven? Well, the bakers in the house know why. Pastor Kenny, you came out of retirement for baking, did you not? The bakers in the house know why he uses and speaks of leaven. 
Because to bake bread or to bake, you only need a small, tiny amount of leaven added to dough, and then give it the right conditions and watch it spread like wildfire. Give it the right conditions and it'll spread like wildfire. Just a little leaven can permeate and transform. Surely just a little bit of hypocrisy is not just too bad for us, right? It's not bad. Family, Jesus is warning us here that what seems like just a small portion of hypocrisy can infect, permeate, and transform our entire lives. But what does Jesus actually mean by hypocrisy? Well, the Greek word that Luke uses here is hupokritas, hupokritas, which means someone who is play-acting, reading from a script or putting on an act, concealing their true selves. Now, that sounds just like those Pharisees that we read about in Luke, right? We know their whole lives were a double standard. But us Christians living in Pretoria 2023, faithfully serving at Rooted Fellowship, at New Hope School, we're nothing like them, right? 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 (laughs) Right? You see, family, when Jesus used the word hypocrite, he means that there is outward conformity without inward reality. Outward conformity without inner reality. You are someone who says one thing at church, but your heart is not holy or really transformed. You say something or behave in a way outwardly, but actually deep down, your heart believes something else. And as Christians, as followers of Jesus, we often do this, right? We sing songs, I have decided to follow Jesus, no turning back, no turning back. We sing these songs, we amen, we hallelujah. But then sometimes we'll walk out of the store and we're like, man, I don't even have coffee today. (sighs) We'll be discouraged. We'll will profess trust and victory that we have in Jesus Christ. But then sometimes as early as the car ride home, something happens and our hearts reveal that we actually believe something entirely instead. We get to work on Monday and those hallelujahs and amens pale into insignificance as we begin to doubt God and we begin to fear the things of this world instead, right? Are we going to have enough? Am I good enough? Am I strong enough? Am I beautiful enough? We don't want to feel rejected by this world. We don't want to be viewed as a weird Jesus follower, so detached from reality. And many times, if we're honest, we actually have bought into the lies of the devil and of this world. Pastor Oni reminds us of this often. He says that Jesus comes to bring abundant life, life to the fullest, John 10, 10 but the devil comes to steal, kill, and destroy. As he whispers lies to us about God. Did God really say he's for you? Do you really have hope in him? Can you really be hopeful in this area that you're prayerfully submitting to God? Nah. Perhaps you should take back control. Isn't living in an obedient, devoted life to Jesus boring? Doesn't the world make things look so much more attractive than obedience to God? Our lips whisper Jesus, but our hearts, our thoughts, and our actions scream, give me the ways and the things of this world. But then here in our text today, Jesus warns us against this double life. Much like the writer of Hebrews has been warning us not to drift from our faith, And he warns us in verses two and three, he says this. He says, there is nothing covered that won't be uncovered. Nothing hidden that won't be made known. Therefore, whatever you have said in the dark will be heard in the light. And what you have whispered in an ear in private rooms will be proclaimed on the housetops. So Jesus warns his followers that a time is coming where everything will be revealed. 
everything is going to be revealed. Psalm 103 verse 12. Psalm 103 verse 12 says that Jesus, or he being Jesus, has removed our sins as far as from the east is from the west. Jesus has removed our sins as far as the east is from the west, which means that our sin has been dealt with. It is done. Tetelestai, finished and clar. But family, a time is coming when all things will be made known. Now hear me. This time is certainly not going to serve as a shaming exercise of God's followers, but rather what Jesus is saying here is this futile exercise of hiding things and living this double standard life. It needs to stop. It needs to stop. Family, we need to stop it. We need to repent. Turn away from these sins and truly, truly, truly believe and embrace the way of the gospel. Amen? And honestly, fam, all of us who are in here who are followers of Jesus, I believe we truly, truly want this. We really do, don't we? We do. But there's just something that keeps us from it. There's something that keeps us from it. And Jesus in his grace and in his wisdom then goes on to address the reason that I believe we as Christians continue to live or are tempted to live these hypocritical lives. Fear. Fear. And so what does Jesus do? Jesus calls out fear and he calls for a reorientation of our fears and he goes in hard. See with me, verse four and five. He says, I say to you, my friends, don't fear. Don't fear those who kill the body and after that can do nothing more. But I will show you the one to fear. Fear him who has authority to throw people into hell after death. Yes, I say to you, this is the one to fear. So in other words, stop fearing others. In fact, stop fearing death itself. But he doesn't say just stop fearing. He tells us what to replace this fear with because he knows how our brains work. After all, he is the creator and sustainer of all things, amen? Let's try a quick experiment. Don't think of a pink elephant. What are you thinking of? But if I say to you, don't think of a pink elephant, think of a blue rhino. What are you thinking of? Good. Rooted fellowship, don't fear criminals or those people or those things such as diseases or illnesses or viruses that can kill the body. Instead, fear God the Father. Revere him, be in awe of him. Love him, submit to him. Proverbs 1 verse 7 speaks of how the beginning of all wisdom is the fear of the Lord. The beginning of all wisdom is the fear of the Lord. Jesus is saying to his followers, hey, don't be hypocrites. Don't believe one thing, but let your lives reflect something else. And he knows why we so often live as hypocrites, as people who believe one thing but do another. He knows that we are fearful people. And so he says to us, Don't fear the things of this world. Don't even fear death. Instead, fear God the Father. Why shouldn't we as followers of Jesus fear death? Well, Pastor Kenny read this morning from Revelation 1. We can see that we have the privilege of being Jesus' followers after the resurrection. In fact, we celebrated that last week, right? What a privilege it is to be God's people post the cross and post the resurrection. Last week, Thursday, we gathered here and we remembered that Jesus Christ lived the perfect sinless life. Last week, Friday, as we journeyed through our email devotions, we remembered that Jesus died the perfect sacrificial and atoning death, thus satisfying God the Father's wrath, righteousness, and justice. And then on Sunday, oh, on Sunday, we remembered that Jesus Christ rose from the dead victorious after conquering sin and death, thus accomplishing eternal life and making a way for all of those who would put their faith and trust in him to know God the Father and to live, live eternally with him in heaven. Amen? Amen. Family, Jesus has defeated sin and even death itself. And so we need not fear it. Christians don't need to fear death. Instead, family, we should fear God the Father who brought about this salvation plan through his son Jesus in the power of the Holy Spirit and who has the authority without Jesus' covering 
to cast us into hell and eternity away from God. That's who we need to fear, and only that. And so if you're here with us today and you haven't put your faith and trust yet in Jesus as your savior, I wanna ask you, do you have a Lord and savior that has conquered sin and death? Is this something that you are longing for? If it is, I encourage you to come up here after the gathering and pray with someone. Perhaps you have a question or you're curious about understanding more about this big, mighty, victorious and loving God. The invitation is the same. Find someone after the gathering and ask. We would love to engage with you. But then, family, Jesus gives us another reason to fear God. If the thought of eternity away from God the Father is not enough, he then says this, verses six and seven. Aren't five sparrows sold for two pennies, yet not one of them is forgotten in God's sight. Indeed, the hairs of your head are all counted. Don't be afraid. You are worth more than many sparrows. Family, God sees you. He knows you. He loves you. And because of Jesus, he delights in you. And in the same way that he takes care of the beautiful and simple creatures that are sparrows, he will take even more care and concern of us. Sparrows in biblical times, as they are today, I guess, were worth so little. And yet God sees them. He provides for them. He takes care of them. And so Jesus is saying, how much more will he do so for us? The final creatures in his creation masterpiece. Brothers and sisters, God knows the number of hairs on your head. For some, that is many, and for some that is less and decreasing day by day, right? (laughs) But nevertheless, he knows the number. He is not a detached God. He authored creation and he orchestrated the salvation plan of all humanity, and yet, he knows you by name. He knows the intimate details of your life. And still he loves us. You are so dear and precious to him and so we need not fear the things of this world. Taxes, inflation, crime, reaper rates, coming elections, COVID 19s, pandemics, sickness, poor health, disease, even physical death. We need not fear these things. For in him, we have an eternal and abundant life. Amen? Now, of course, we can be concerned about them. We can wisely plan for them. God's word tells us that. We can honor God by being good stewards of the resources we have to deal with them. But family, do not miss it. We need not fear them. We need not fear them. Paul writes this to the church in Philippi in Philippians verses six of seven of chapter four, and he says this, don't worry about anything, but in everything, through prayer and petition with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen? Amen. And so we can pray for provision and protection and for wisdom. We can pray for protection, for provision, and for wisdom. We should but we need not fear these things, the things of this fallen, broken world. Christians don't even need to fear rejection. We don't need to fear rejection in this world. Jesus says in verses eight and nine, he says, and I say to you, anyone who acknowledges me before others, the son of man, which is another title for Jesus the Messiah, who is both fully God and fully man, the son of man will also acknowledge him before the angels of God. But whoever denies me before others will be denied before the angels of God. So in other words, family, Jesus is saying to those close followers of him, most of whom would go on to be killed for their faith in him, he says to them that all of those who put their faith and trust in Jesus have their eternal life secured. 
And so they need not fear the afterlife. The Bible tells us that a time is coming, we reflected a little bit on it today on Revelation 1, but a time is coming when every knee will bow, we sung this, every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, amen? And a time is coming when all the names of those who believed in Jesus before such time will be read out before all the hosts of angels. You can go read about it in Revelation 20. And those who have believed in Jesus as their Lord and Savior before this coming time will continue to spend eternity with him. But those who have rejected him and who didn't put their faith and trust in him will spend eternity cast away from him. Family of God, has this world rejected you? You are not alone. It has rejected Jesus as well. Are you suffering? and you're oftentimes feeling alone, Jesus says in John 16, verse 33, he says, you will have suffering in this world. Be courageous. I have conquered the world. This broken world is not meant to be our home. Family, this broken world is not meant to feel like our home. But we have a Lord and Savior who knew rejection so that we could be accepted. And in doing so, he welcomes us warmly into his family on earth, the church. The family of God here on earth. And so brothers and sisters in the Lord, we need not fear the things of this world. We don't need to fear death and we don't even need to fear rejection in this life because of the joy, life, acceptance, belonging and identity that we have secured in Jesus Christ, amen? And then finally, we come to the last reason for this morning, just for this morning, but we come to the last reason for this morning that we as Christians do not need to fear anything because Jesus says the following in verses 10 to 12. He says, anyone who speaks a word against the Son of Man will be forgiven, but the one who blasphemes against the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven. Whenever they bring you before the synagogues and rulers and authorities, don't worry about how you should defend yourselves or what you should say, for the Holy Spirit will teach you at that very hour yeah. what must be said. Yeah. Don't worry. Don't worry. Now, in essence, I'm going to go to verse 10 first. Verse 10 is actually somewhat elaborating on verses 8 and 9, okay? There's been a lot of debate about this verse over the years, but essentially what Jesus is saying here is that you cannot accept Jesus Christ without the Holy Spirit prompting you to do so. Yeah. As Pastor Orne said this last week, he said, left to our own devices, without the prompting of the Holy Spirit, we would never come to accept Jesus. Yeah. God's grace in our lives is initiated by him. It is then accomplished through Jesus and is brought about and completed in the power of the Holy Spirit. And so if you constantly sin by rejecting the Holy Spirit's promptings to accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior, well, then you won't ever accept Jesus. Biblical scholars have commented on this verse saying that to reject the Holy Spirit in this way means that a person continually does this by shutting themselves off from God so much that they are unaware of any sin in their lives at all. But many Christians, when they read this verse, they are, they're concerned about whether or not they have ever committed such a sin. And family, if you are a follower of Jesus and you're concerned at all, I have good news for you. Your very concern over if you ever have committed such a sin, that in itself reveals a recognition of, that, of sin in your life yeah. and the need that you have for putting your faith and trust in your Savior, Jesus Christ. Yeah. So take comfort. But if you're not a Christian, and upon hearing this verse, you experience concern, then as I mentioned earlier, I'd ask you to examine your heart and see where you are in light of your relationship with Jesus Christ. Perhaps the Holy Spirit is prompting you right now to respond to God and to accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior. And so if that's you, won't you come up here afterwards and share this with someone after the gathering? Pray with them. Don't miss this opportunity. Don't continue to reject the Holy Spirit. Back to our text. Verse 10 leads beautifully into verse 11, which tells us the final reason in this passage that Christians do not need to fear. And to see this, I want you to take note, deep note of verses 11 and 12. It says this. 
Verse 11, whenever they bring you before synagogues and rulers or authorities, don't worry about how you should defend yourselves or what you should say. For the Holy Spirit will teach you at that very hour what must be said. Now, many of Jesus' disciples that he was speaking to here in these verses were in actual fact brought before rulers and authorities. And they stood trial for the fact that they believed in Jesus as their Lord and Savior. But here we have Jesus saying to them that they should not worry. Do not worry about how to defend their belief in him. Because when such times come, the Holy Spirit will teach them at that very moment what to say. Now we as Christians in South Africa in 2023, we may not ever be put on trial for our faith in Jesus. But this does not mean that we will not face persecution, opposition, or even ridicule. Family, we are, we are incredibly privileged in that we live in a time and a place that allows for us to openly believe in Jesus Christ. However, we should not take this for granted, nor should we think that that may forever be the case. The gospel demands a response, and very often society's response to the gospel is rejection and ridicule. And if you've been following Jesus for long enough, you'd know that sooner or later, you will face opposition for your belief. You may face rejection and you may even face ridicule for your beliefs. Maybe at work, in your social circles, at college, at varsity, at school, or even at home within your very family. And even in these situations, Jesus has some encouraging words for his followers. He says, do not worry about what to say. You don't have to spend hours of time fearing and worrying about what to say and how to say it. Instead, pray and wait on the Holy Spirit, for he will give you the words to say. Many of us have been praying for our one mores this year. You'll remember at the beginning of the year, we had our baptismal bath out here, and Pastor One said, let's put the names of those who you are praying would come to faith in Jesus Christ into that baptismal bath, and we're going to rejoice when they are eventually baptized in this church. Yeah. But many of us have been praying for them this year. And we would have undoubtedly been thinking about inviting them to church and engaging with them or how to share the gospel with them or perhaps to answer their questions about Jesus. You don't need to worry about them, about what you're gonna say for the Holy Spirit will lead you in those times. Or perhaps you face opposition at work or at home for the hope that you have in Jesus Christ and the fact that you're a Christian. You don't need to worry, the Holy Spirit will guide you in those times. Jesus says, do not worry. Do not fear. Instead, lean on the Holy Spirit and the Spirit will bring to mind what needs to be said and done as you engage. Now, family, hear me. That doesn't mean that we shouldn't pray for these folks and about these situations. It doesn't mean that we shouldn't be prepared with verses to lean on and the facts about Jesus and the Bible. We are all theologians, right? 1 Peter 3, verse 15 says, but in your hearts regard Christ the Lord as holy, ready at any time to give a logical defense to anyone who asks you for the reason for the hope that is in you. Amen. Jesus is telling us Amen. to be prepared and ready to share more about our faith. But he is also reminding us that we should not worry, we should not fear or be anxious and that we should take comfort and reassurance in the fact that when those times come, we will be able to confidently rely on the Holy Spirit to teach us what to say at that very time. Yeah. How good is God? God so good. And so, how does this all relate to post-pandemic me? We've gone through Luke 12, verses 1 to 12. How does this relate to post-pandemic me? Well, we can see from our text today that Jesus calls his followers to live a life that is free from worry and fear. He calls us to journey through life with him and with one another. And as we do so, we are able to experience the joy and the abundant life that our good shepherd laid down his life to purchase for us. But family of God, is that what we are really experiencing in the aftermath of the last three years? Or are we still very much gripped by fear and anxiety? Aren't we in many ways allowing our joy and abundant life to be stolen from us? 
stolen by the thief, the devil, who comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. Sister and brother in the Lord, if that's you, you're not alone. You are not alone. Your struggles are unique and they are real, but you need to hear that you are not alone. In fact, Jesus, in his goodness and his grace, knew that, that this is something that his followers would face. And that's why he speaks so much about believers not needing to fear, like we saw in our text in Luke 12 today. And so how are things with post-pandemic me? How are things with post-pandemic me? Allow me to share a bit more about post-pandemic me. I can remember in 2019, it was about November 2019, we, we had a bigger staff contingent at that time. We had some church plants residents and we all gathered together in our staff room and we were like, man, let's plan for 2020. And we mapped out sermon series. We mapped out so many things and we were so excited about what God was gonna do in and through Rooted Fellowship in 2020. And I remember 15th March coming here. It was like, hey, this thing's coming. I don't know if you guys will recall, we, we didn't do coffee. We did like still waters and was it like fruit or something like that? So people couldn't, interact and couldn't touch the coffee and, the, and the, uh, the snacks. And then that very next week, we went into lockdown. So we lost the year of 2020, that whole, uh, all our dreams that we had for this church for 2020. We, my, my wife and I live in a first floor, two bedroom apartment. Now I love to run, I love to get out and I love to not be still. So being six weeks in a, in a house was very difficult for me. I'm not gonna lie to you. Her work blew, blew up, which we are thankful for by God's grace. It was incredible, they, her work grew. And so she had like many things to do. But I was faced with a bit of an existential crisis. We spent every day planning and thinking about church. And now it was like, okay, things a bit boring. I don't know if I have a purpose anymore. Then to hear that and hear and learn of loved ones passing away of people within our community and not being able to be there for them, not being able to pastor them. Then 2021 rolled around and COVID-19 started to get closer and closer to my loved ones, learning of people that had passed on. Again, not being able to go to memorials, not being able to be there. My family went through a tough time as well in 2021. Not being able to be there for them was also very, very challenging. Then 2021, September rolled around and I got COVID. I've always taken pride in my health and doing the right things, but then COVID came knocking. Being, uh, what's the word, quarantined from my wife in our two bedroom apartment was challenging. But we made it through by God's goodness and His grace. And then 22, 2022 rolled around. And one Monday night, I was rushed to the ER because I was struggling to walk. And I was told I needed back surgery. And then after that, I was told that my foot may never heal, my nerve may never heal again. We'll have to wait and see. A Couple of weeks later, after being off the medication, medication started to create havoc with my system and I developed a heart complication. And eventually saw one doctor, saw a cardiac doctor, saw a therapist, saw a physio, and eventually someone said to me, hey, have you it sounds like the symptoms that you're talking about reveal anxiety in your life. Are you, are you anxious? And I started to realize that I was gripped with fear and anxiety, even had to take some medication. Family, eventually you add all these things up over three years and you start to feel like, man, your fears keep coming to be. The worst thing that you can think of starts happening. I worried about my health, I worried about the loved ones and I got sick. I stressed all night about that thing that I, I was so worried about and it came to be. But then family, at some point, no, in actual fact, at many points, I needed to decide who I believed. Yeah. Was I going to let the struggles of my life, my feelings, my emotions, and my circumstances dictate to me what I believed about God and who he said I was? Or was I going to take these thoughts captive and submit all of these to what God says 
he is in his word and who I am in light of that. And it took time, and truth be told, it's an ongoing struggle that requires intentionality. And this intentionally looks like this. It looks like asking others to pray for you. It's showing up and telling others, I'm not okay. I'm not doing okay. It's allowing others to show up and be there for you. It means learning to lean on others. And most importantly, it means spending time in the word. Some scholars have said that the, the phrasing or a similar phrasing to do not fear or be not afraid occurs 365 times in the Bible. Now, there's some debate about that, but the point is there's a lot of do not fears in the Bible, enough that we could spend every single day meditating on that truth. Yeah. Do not fear. Yeah. It means daily meditating on Scripture, memorizing the words we find in the Bible, and talking back to the whispers causing you to doubt and fear. Yeah. Declaring that Jesus is bigger than what I am feeling right now and in some situations, it means consulting with doctors and therapists, and at their direction, making use of medications. It means, fam, allowing Jesus to heal and restore you, and recognizing that he works through and in community, yeah. in his church, and through his followers. Amen? Family, our prayer for this time was that it would be a time of healing and restoration, of laying down the past hurts, traumas, and disappointments of the past three years or so. There are people in here that are not okay. We are not okay. Living a life, living life from a place of fear. Brother and sister, it's time to lay it down. Won't you come up here after the gathering today and lay it down? Lay it down at Jesus' feet. You can even ask someone to pray with you if you'd like, or won't you make use of the prayer jar or a prayer at Rooted fellowship.com, but family, let's leave this place today different from how we have been living in the past few years, amen? I'm gonna call the band up as I prepare to land the plane. Brothers and sisters of Rooted Fellowship, we have a savior who knows that we need to be reminded time and time and time again that we do not need to fear the things of this world. We do not need to fear rejection. We do not need to fear persecution. We do not even need to fear death itself. We have a Father who sees us, who is for us, and who knows the number of hairs on our heads. He sent his son Jesus to make a way for us to draw near to him again and to live with him eternally. And we have his Holy Spirit to empower and equip us to face the challenges of the day. Amen? Yeah. Family, I invite you to stand as we respond in prayer before we respond in song. Would you stand with me? Oh, good, loving God, we thank you that you've given us your word. Because in your word, Lord God, in Isaiah 41, verse 10, we're told that we do not need to fear, for you are with us. We do not need to be afraid, for you are our God that you will strengthen us, you will help us, and so we can hold on to you, Lord God, because you will never let go of us. Lord God, we come before you as, as a people longing to be a people marked by hope, victory, and integrity, and no longer marked by fear and anxiety and hypocrisy, Lord God. We wanna be your people who live out your gospel, who live out the call of our lives, Lord God, who don't doubt you, Lord God. Would you come now, Holy Spirit, and heal and restore us? Lord God, there are folks in here who are struggling with physical and mental illnesses, Lord God. Come and move, come and heal, Lord Jesus. Lord God, there are those of us in here fearing death today. We're fearing rejection, we're fearing ridicule, we're fearing persecution. Thank you, Lord God, that we have comfort in you and comfort in your word, comfort in one another. Would you take away this fear, Lord God? Help us to replace this fear with fear of you, a reverence for you, an awe of you, Lord God, or of who you are and what you have done for us. Would 
We thank you for your presence in our lives, Lord God, your Holy Spirit. We thank you for your acceptance. We thank you, Jesus, that you were rejected so that we may spend eternity with you. Would you come now, Lord God, and equip us to be your people on mission, people who are no longer fearful, Lord God, but who are filled with love and awe and adoration for you, Lord God. We thank you, Lord God, that you've won the battle already, Lord God. That we need not fear that we get to participate in, the, in what you're doing, Lord God, but you have won this battle already, and so we need not fear. Because, Lord God, we know how the story ends. We know how the story ends, Lord God, in victory because of everything that you have done for us. May we rest in that, Jesus. Continue to be our daily provision. We thank you, Lord God, that we have your word and that as we read story after story, we see how you provided, you intervened, you stepped in, you made a way, Lord God. May we know that as you see the number of hairs on our heads, you will make a way in the challenges of our lives. And so may we be obedient to you, all to your honor and glory. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.